So I'll begin by telling you guys a little bit about myself. My name is Inwad. I spent most of my life in Canada, in Ottawa to be exact. But I was born here. I was born here in Mogadishu. I left at a very young age, but I pretty much spent my whole life in Canada. So I've always considered myself just a regular Canadian girl. But even so, my, my connection to Somalia has always been very deep-rooted. And I've always really known where I came from and my relationship to Somalia. Because throughout my life, <clears throat> not only mine, but my sister's as well, we've always had a constant reminder of where we came from. And that was in part because of my mother. She used to tell us about what Somalia was like before the conflict, her day-to-day -day life. We used to see pictures of the clothes they used to wear and how they lived. And she always used to tell us these stories about this man that really seemed like a fictional character to my sisters and I. And we really didn't know that somebody like that actually existed. And the person that she spoke so kindly about and with such admiration was her late husband and actually my father. And that was Elman Ali Ahmed. And um, till this day, he's actually considered as the Somali father of peace in Mogadishu. So the work that he did was really admirable. And it's kind of what always kept my family and I, even when we were abroad in Canada and grew up in a whole new culture, what kept us so close to Somalia. I'll begin by telling you guys a little bit about his story and what exactly made him such a household name, even 16 years after his passing. So Elman, he actually left Mogadishu in his early adolescence and he moved to Italy where he was actually enrolled in a boarding school where he actually got to a chance that many others didn't in his situation where he got to pursue his education all the way until he graduated university. Then in 1982, he came back to Mogadishu and when he came back to Mogadishu, he really stood out like a sore thumb. He wore shorts that were really bright colored above his knees. He had long dreadlocks. He skipped to his own beat. And he really stood out everywhere he went. And and he was an engineer by trade. When he came back to Mogadishu, he opened mechanic garages. He opened electronic shops. And <clears throat> because he was so thankful, for the opportunity that he received and the education that he got, he wanted to give that back to the vulnerable youth. So he really targeted orphans and street children and actually took them out of the situation that they were in and brought them to his centers, trained them. And then actually gave them jobs within his businesses. Out of the 16 districts in Mogadishu, he ended up owning businesses in 14 of the districts. And all of them were the management level, the functional staff, all of it was run by former street children and orphans. So what he contributed to Somalia was really, he was a social entrepreneur and really somebody that had a really big impact in Somalia. So when things actually took a turn for the worse in Somalia after the collapse of uh, the Siadbur regime, he wanted to extend the services and the education and the alternative livelihood opportunities that he was giving to street children to just to also children that were involved in armed conflicts. He actually had a motto that became that caught on like wildfire, and it was called "Drop the gun, drop the gun, pick up the pen." Which till this day, 20 years after, is still written all over the walls of Somalia. And um, <clears throat> that, what it did is, what his, his mission was very simple, and his purpose of doing that was very clear as well. He believed that the majority of those involved in the armed conflicts were youth on either sides. On either sides, the majority were always youth. So he felt by presenting them with appealing opportunities and providing them with alternative livelihoods and giving them skills that they could use to sustain themselves, then in turn, they would not contribute to being a part of the violence. And by taking out those that were the majority, that were actually contributing to the violence, then he felt that peace building would be a lot easier. And the ones that were left, the warlords, whoever they may have been, they would be easier to reconciliate. The plan was actually working. His plan was working. Hundreds of young child soldiers were leaving their posts as gunmen and security staff to warlords. It really got him a lot of recognition locally. And people that loved him told him that you can't do this. 
not during this time. You have to protect yourself and you have to get security. People were willing to work for him for free and to guard them with their lives, but he didn't want to be a hypocrite. So he said, I'm not going to tell these young, these young men to protect me with their lives and carry guns when the whole message I'm trying to preach is that weapons don't solve anything. So in his true nature, what he did is he walked the busy streets and the dangerous streets of Mogadishu without any sort of protection. And one day, on March 9th, he was uh, presented with an ultimatum. And that ultimatum was either stop disarming children or stop living. And anybody that really knew him believes that that is the only way that he would have ever stopped what he was doing. He would have rather died than stopped to stop trying to save children and the situation that they were in. And that ultimately was his fate.